Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the journey that we've been on for about the last 11 months, setting up and operationalising the Centre of Expertise in Australia. Um, and so in Melbourne and Sydney, um, Bangalore, Chengdu, Singapore and Manila. So we've been um, responsible for enabling 5,000 people across 500 squads in six regions to start their journey towards agile maturity as part of one of the biggest corporate experiments in um, transforming, transforming to agile. So um, I'm going to start with what the centre of expertise is. So it's really represented by this box here, which I hope most of you can see. So um, really what we've been doing is an art and a science. So we're open and transparent, that's why I use this box, and we're multi-layered. So um, we, open, we open and we work at several layers. So within our box um, contains many things. So we always work to time, that's why we have um, uh, a, a time scale in here. We um, have a range of tools and techniques that I'm going to talk to you about today, um, but all of our coaches um, are, receive a similar kind of box, and we've, we've really, really um, completely pra pragmatic, which is why I've talked about moving from dogma to pragma. So what I'm going to do over the course of today is talk to you about um, the journey that we've undertaken. So I'll come back to my box, but I just wanted to sort of frame the, the work that we're doing. Um, so, um, what I wanted to understand in terms of who we've got in the audience is um, I wanted to talk to you about, um, oh, here's a quick, so I wanted to sort of talk to you first about, um, ah, wrong way, no, not working, okay, I'll just use the power of my fingers. Um, I wanted to say first, we've had a good innings. So what we've done is we've um, got a great team in place. We have um, enabled people to start their journey to maturity. We've um, set up a coaching accelerator. We've set up a coaching radar. We've established some feedback channels. Um, we have started some measurement. We've got some metrics in place. We've started um, enabling the organisation to understand flow of work. We've started to break down um, work and actually translate that into value. So we've started, we've started um, our journey, which is great, and we've started the setup of the, of the centre of expertise, and we've started to operationalise all of those things, which is really good. Um, and we've done that in quite a compressed time frame. So um, as with any organisational transformation, um, there's a, there's a sense of urgency and there's a time scale to which we have to work. So. One of the, one of the, um, the reasons why I've talk, titled this talk From Dogma to Pragma is that our over, overarching um, urgency has been led in terms of our pragmatic approach. So one of the things that we haven't done is we haven't taken an, uh, an agile approach and we haven't enforced that on the organisation. So, oh, nice. Um, sorry, I'm just getting lots of different sounds over there. Um, so um, what I wanted to understand here is who likes cricket? Who likes cricket? Great. Okay. So, um, what kind of cricket do people like? So, just give me some, give you some different types of cricket. What kind of cricket do people play or like? In test cricket, what else? Twenty twenty. One day. What else? Yep. Okay. Okay. So, lots, and lots of. Um, great types of cricket. So we've got someone here to asking us. Sorry, I don't know. Maybe this is okay. So who likes cricket? Um, so there's lots and lots of different types of cricket that are available to us. And um, I'm a cricket fan. So over the Australian summer, um, I've been reflecting on cricket. So I really, I'm really am a Test cricket. Fan. I love test cricket. I love the strategy around test cricket. I love the five-day notion of it. I love that um, you know you can come out that you, as a family. We can go to the cricket and we can get settled in, and we can know that we can sort of go to the bathroom. We can go and get our drinks, and maybe nothing much is going to happen, 
but we know that there's a lot of thought that's going into every play. But really, if we think about the kind of um, transformation that ANZ has been going on, I've really been analogising um, the approach that we've been taking, and really we've had to move to more of a one-day um, or even a 20-20 cricket approach. So what we've had to bring out is we've had to bring out all the bells and whistles. So anyone who goes and watches 2020 knows that at every break something has to happen. So we have to keep people entertained, we have to bring out different approaches, we have to experiment. So the way that I think 2020 was designed, I think that the um, cricketing boards around the world um, thought about every single marketing idea that they've ever had, they put it on a Kanban board, they said, we're going to experiment with everything, and actually they have. They've divided amongst all the teams. And I think that the approach that we've been taking at ANZ is a, a little bit similar. So what we've said is, we've asked people to turn up and to play cricket. And that's what people have done. But um, as we've just heard, there's lots of different ways to play cricket. And so some people have, have come and they've said, yep, I'm really here. I know how to play cricket and I, I'm, up for, I'm up for the game. And so they've arrived and they're really excited about it. Some people have said, I've never heard of cricket. I actually, I really don't want to play. And actually, I, I'm just not going to do it. Some people have said, I'm here to play, but I love beach cricket. So if we're playing beach cricket, I'm your person. And then we've got everyone in between. So we have been um, on a journey to try to get everybody aligned. So that's what we've been doing um, a little bit. So I think cricket's a beautiful game and um, we've been trying to enable a beautiful transformation. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this again. Again, I'm not loading here. <laughs> okay, so um, what's been really important then is for us to um, decide to get aligned. So, um, We've, so where we are, where we've been, we got to in the transformation is we said, okay, are we are we aligned? Um, just bring this um, so we we had all these people who came um, to um, to the transformation, and we said, okay, um, at an organisational level. Someone like ANZ has been through lots and lots of transformations, lots and lots of restructures, but this one was really, has been really different. It's been different for a couple of reasons. One is because we've got a, it's, it's top down. So we've got a really fantastic CEO um, who really believes in the change that's, that's being undertaken. And um, one of the things that we also did from a transformation perspective is we took a long time to talk to everybody about what the, what the journey was we were going, we were undertaking. And we also gave people to opt out of, um, opt out of the journey. So um, there was a lot of voluntary redundancy that was offered. And so the, the premise, the hypothesis there was that people who were staying for the long haul were there because they wanted to be there. So that was very different from some of the other restructures I've certainly been a part of, or restructures that have happened to me. And so, the hypothesis going in was that people who were there were really were really um, on for the on for the ride, so that was um, that was great. We also did a lot of work around growth mindset, and so people coming in, um, the the premise was and and still is that people are there um, with the right mindset, and we also enabled people to um, be to go for roles that were um, that were being um, that were they were able to go for roles where um, they may not actually have all of the skills, but they were able to go for roles where potential was um, was something that was really important. So that was a really that was also a really different um, a really different restructuring, really different opportunity. So um, so the the the, um, the you know the elements of success were really there. So what we had to do though is we had to make sure that the people who were there were aligned and. Also, from the from the centre of expertise and setting up that centre of expertise, what was really important for the the area that I was running is that from a coaching and a reskilling and a value value acceleration area, we were really the people who were going to help um, change the mindsets, so grow people, and also 
um, enable the um, technical and delivery capability uplift that the organisation needed. So from a recruitment point of view, a values alignment point of view, and a capability uplift point of view, we needed to be right on point. So um, that was a big job um, that was um, enabled us, that, that, was, that was set up for us. So but my hypothesis was that if we were able to get the CEO, CEO people to start thinking differently, we would then be able to get the, the rest of the organisation to start working differently. And so that was, that was where we started. So um, it was really important to really to go in from right from the beginning with a, a very experimental and creative approach because we knew that we didn't have all, any of the answers or, um, at all. Um, and so we're going to have to be trying lots and lots of things and that's what we've, we've been doing. So one of the, the starting positions, um, given the size and the scope of the challenge, was right from the beginning, I, I realised that we were going to have to um, start thinking quite differently. And so I coined a phrase around thinking systemically to optimise locally. So um, I did that um, because I, I knew that we were going to have to we we're going to have to look broadly, but we're also going to have to be able to focus really effectively at an individual and a squad level. And you all know you all know this. We've talked about this, especially in the last couple of days. Um, that you know, as as coaches, especially you, you, you want to start, you want to go where you're loved, and you start, want to start where you're loved, and hopefully. Um, stay where you loved um, and continue to influence influence that position. But um, we really knew that um, we were going to have to think quite differently and try to work through a systemic approach to enable that success to be able to permeate, to permeate through the organisation. And that for people working within the COE, they're going to have to think and work at these two different levels. So think at a systemic level, but also think how they can optimise locally. So that's where we that's where we got to. So um, you know we all know that there are many many approaches to to agile. You know Scrum, Kanban, XP, Scaled Agile, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And one of the ways that we could have undertaken this transformation from a from a whole holistic point of view is we could have just said, okay, we're going to um, adopt an approach, and that would have been quite that would have been one way to do it. But that's what, that's what we didn't do at ANZ. We decided we were going to do something different. What we did start to do, though, is there was a decision made to um, try to get the, the top leadership aligned um, from a sort of base level understanding of Agile um, through introducing them to SAFE. And so we, there was a training program that started with SAFE um, for the leadership level. And so we started that and then we stopped it. And so it, both of those things were actually really confusing. So um, we, um, we, that, was, that was really quite, um, quite confronting for a lot of people and it actually raised a lot of questions. So there were still areas that were using SAFE, there were areas that, was, that wanted to use SAFE, there were areas that thought SAFE was agile there were areas that um, were just quite perplexed as to why this journey had, had, um, had continued. But ANZ was quite deliberate in saying, we're not going to tell you how to work. We're going to, to offer you opportunities to work in a range of agile frameworks um, that actually suit you. And so that was, a, that was quite a different way than, other, than some other people have undertaken their, their transformations. So the hypothesis there was that we we're going to provide basic information to get people on the same page, but um, it didn't quite work in that it actually raised a lot of questions that are still that are still um, still there. So we haven't quite resolved that one. Um, so we then we then moved to. Um, so we then moved to. Um, Getting the right people, getting the right players on the ground, and so this was really the most one of the most important things that we did. So when I came in, we did have a couple of coaches who were in play, um, but they were coaching quite differently to what I perceived we we needed for um, for the levels of maturity or the vastness of the of the differences of levels of maturity that we had in play. So we needed. Uh, 
I went to be really very deliberate about the kinds of people and the diversity of people that we needed to recruit. And so I took quite a bit of time and, and a design thinking approach to um, deciding on the kinds of people that we're going to recruit. So we also needed to recruit across six regions and so that, that also had a range of challenges. Um, and as you can see here, so we inherited an organisational design. I inherited an organisational design that said, <clears throat> based on what the domains had wanted, so we, we sort of had a Spotify model in place. Based on what the, dema the, the domains wanted, they, they sort of felt they needed 75 coaches. <clears throat> and from a ratio perspective, that meant that it was going to be one coach to nine, nine squads, which is pretty high. But, and on the right is, and, and they, they also thought, they suggested from an org design point of view that those coaches would operate as a guild and all the 75 people would then report into me. And so that obviously doesn't take too long to think that that's not going to work. So um, immediately we had to experiment around that model. So <coughs> I immediately put it, tried to put in place a chapter model. And that meant I had to then look for chapter leads, which wasn't in the original design. And that was, again, trying to look for domain coaches who were chapter leads who could then coach and lead and do a range of things. So that was, um, that was interesting. Um, so on the right um, were, are the three levels of coaches that we have, or the th three types of coaches. So we have squad coaches, tech area coaches, and domain coaches. And that's the, that's the organisational design that we have. And there's, uh, there's some common attributes there. But on the left is the Venn diagram that I designed, which in my second day in the role. So <clears throat> I, did, I did design this, and then I, then I took a design thinking approach to, to what I was shopping around. Um, <clears throat> and then I talked to a range of stakeholders. I talked to um, internal and external um, consultants about what they felt was working well in, in the marketplace, etc. And really, um, the key thing to this is that in the we had another region, another area in the organi in our organisation that was already in our NWOW, our new ways of working approach, and they'd brought in a range of coaches and a range of people to to start the journey. And theirs was a, a strong cultural transformation, and they'd brought in some coaches that um, didn't necessarily have strong agile or lean systems thinking skills. Um, which could be, which can be fine, except they actually also weren't really training them in that. So they, they were really working from a cultural change point of view and a mindset change point of view, which is absolutely okay as long as you're looking at the behavioural and the practice change as well. So one of the things that I felt was really important is given we were actually transforming um, to a new way of working that was based on um, an agile transformation, we really needed to try to attract as many people who had that core understanding um, as possible. So we looked for people who had a combination of, <coughs> of the skills in this Venn diagram. The center is really important though. So we wanted people who had empathy, adaptive leadership, um, customer focus and growth mindset. And um, that was really important because I also needed to attract some people internally. So we also needed to, to um, enable a growth, uh, uh, an internal um, pipeline of people. We didn't really have many coaches internally, but we also, we needed to start growing them. And we needed to start growing scrum masters and for them to see that there was a, a career path as well. So if you look at this um, Venn diagram, you can see that if you've got, you know, adaptive leadership and those kind of skills and knowledge and expertise and delivery expertise, you're going to be able to help from a transformative delivery uplift perspective. You're going to be able to help from a, capability uplift, um, adaptive leadership, delivery expertise and domain expertise, you're going to be able to help from a technical capability uplift, um, adaptive leadership, do domain expertise and knowledge and experience, you're going to be able to help from a spot performance up uplift perspective. So think there, someone in security, for example, who's very, um, very much uh, an expert, who doesn't have any agile experience, it's quite a different leadership challenge than um, somebody who's a delivery person in, in a, from a software perspective. So we were, we were quite deliberate in terms of what we were doing there. So the recruitment challenge was quite interesting. So we had a, a quite a unique um, approach in terms of what we were doing. We had a, um, a, a fast um, um, approach because we're in a, a race for talent like everybody. 
but one of the key things that we did quite differently was a, the role play um, component of that. Um, and that was really where we separated the wheat from the chaff. So I still remember some of the really, really brilliant role plays that we did that left me um, as the recipient of the, of the role play feelings amazingly brilliant within a couple of minutes. And that was a, a quite an, an incredible um, experience. And that really showed whether or not somebody actually had the chops or not. And then I equally remember um, still, and I still pass some of the, some of the people um, in the corridor and think, they just left me feeling, you know, I, I remember being prostrate on the, on the desk saying, please, just help me. And they were still um, using the coaching model of saying, you know, please, uh, just t tell, me, tell me how I can help you. I was like, just do anything, do anything. And I'm lying on the desk saying, just do anything. And they, still, they just still couldn't change their mental model or use any other coaching techniques to enable me to, um, to help me in that role play even though they looked amazing on paper and if I just reviewed their CVs and just, um, you know, done a behavioural event interview, I would have taken them, but with the role play was actually the way that we separated those. So we've done 670 interviews in um, a couple of months. So um, and if anyone wants to talk about the approach that we've taken and how we've, how we've done that, I'm happy to discuss that because it, um, we've, got a lot of, we've got a lot of data. <laughs> so it's, it's been good. Oh, God. Still going backwards. Okay, so our construct, I'm not going to spend too, too long on this, but it, um, we basically um, have set up in terms of chapters. So I referred before that we didn't have chapters initially, so we now have chapters. We've got chapter leads, which are not um, aligned, they're not hierarchically aligned to um, the domain, um, how, how people work in the domain. So, um, we, it's sort of a more of a matrix model. Um, we also, one of the key things that we have is feature squads. So within the, the COE, um, there's a lot of work that we do to, do, to deliver value um, in terms of the tools and techniques, et cetera, that we create for the organisation. And that's now our feature squads. And we also have a reskilling accelerator, which is where we've, um, we're creating the opportunity for people to retrain as software engineers um, a value acceleration accelerator, so helping people learn um, about value streams and metrics, and also coaching accelerator. So I made reference before um, to um, recruiting internally. So one of the things that we did in terms of internal recruitment is we took on people who had great potential, but they didn't have a lot of uh, the people that we took on um, may have had a little bit of agile experience or may have had a little bit of coaching experience, but generally didn't have a lot of either or sometimes none of either but what they had is great potential. But that meant that there was a huge gap that we had to close and had to close quickly. Quickly, So we created a coaching accelerator where we retrained people to, be, to become coaches, and that's been really successful. So we then extended that coaching accelerator to be a scrum master accelerator because we also need scrum masters, um, which is a hat role in, at ANZ, which means that people can choose, choose to be that role or they're voluntold to be that role. And we need, as coaches, because there's only 75 across a population of 5,000, for them to be um, as effectively um, as possible um, skilled in, in um, and we use the, the coaching accelerator to do that. So we also then said, okay, do, do we understand how to play the game? And um, we realised that we had some great people coming in and they had lots of great ideas. And if we were in a really small... Um, organization um, and we had a small challenge it would have been great to just say okay go ahead and coach and um, and see what you see what you can do um, but because our challenge was so large and our scope was so large and we also were really time bound because um, we, people were going to come into our tranches from October we really needed to be quite um, rather deliberate about the approach that we're going to take initially, not, not prescriptive in terms of how people were going to work, but just in terms of the kinds of um, approach that we wanted to take. So we, we created a service catalogue, which we designed with um, a range of the coaches. And you can see here, and I can talk to anyone who's here over the next few days in, in more detail about this. So basically the approach is based on Shuhari. We created an approach here also that enables people to flex across the model. So 
when you're dealing with large populations, it can't be one. It can't be one approach. So it was really around consult, educate, um, facilitate, mentor, and then coach. And then um, the the um, the approach is really activate, accelerate, amplify, and then to basically work ourselves out of a job um, to get to sustain. So we really want to be able to get, enable self-organising teams. There's so many teams that we're never going to work ourselves out of a job. There's always going to be another squad that needs help, but that's the objective that we're working to. And you can see on the right, the, um, we're working in terms of maturity levels from beginning to sustainable, and that also means the level of um, support that's needed from a coaching perspective. Um, our principles, which I won't go over because I'm, I'm almost out of time, I think. Um, our principles are really important to us. We're driven by our principles, and these were created um, right in the beginning by the team, and they've been revisited, and they're the basis of the social contract, um, uh, and yeah, they've been revisited a couple of times. But the really important thing um, for us is also the equipment that um, that we we've, we've created. So when we came in, I was given three role descriptions, and then said, "Okay, go ahead and uh, go ahead and transform." Um, all of these people, and I was like, ah, where's the, um, where's the material? Where's the collateral? Um, and I was told there wasn't any. So that was a bit of a surprise, um, but luckily I like creating things, so that was actually okay. So basically what we did is we created, and this is, this is where we come back to the box. So we created um, all of these um, coaching toolkits, and we created um, these little kits for everybody, um, which outline our approach. Um, and then on each of the cards that we've created, we have, um, and people can have a look at these later, but um, we have something that says, um, so, something aligned to the service catalog. So it says something like service, service the big issues. And on the back we've got, what is it? How do you do it? You know when you're done when watch out for. And then on, we've set up on Confluence um, a whole lot of additional information and resources and workshops with facilitator guides, a whole lot of additional links, um, external resources, etc., so that people can use these cards with their squads and do a whole lot of um, additional workshops, etc., and then add to them. So when new, new people join the team, um, they're invited to um, continue to um, contribute to these um, this material, which is great. Um, and then obviously we use um, collaborative tools to continue that that piece of work. Um, one of the really important things that we that we had to agree was how do we start. So we had a couple of decisions around how do we start. Um, again, we could have just said um, off you go. Um, but one of the things we wanted to do was be a bit, little bit more deliberate about that because some of the teams that we're going into were just not ready to receive any kind of support and we, ha we wanted to make sure that the people we were, the, the scarce coaches that we had were going where they loved, they were loved. So that was one of our overarching principles. And so um, we wanted to set up this quick start to sort of say, okay, let's give ourselves the best chance for success. So coaching readiness is the start of that, then the coaching canvas, and um, I, again, I can go through this in more detail. But I wanted to talk. I wanted to move on to the coaching canvas and the assessment because they're the two core skills, core, core tools that we have. So the, the quick start starts that. But our coaching canvas is really our core tool. So the coaching canvas is where we um, basically start our engagement with our domains, tech areas, and our squads. So we use this to say, hi, um, how may we help you? What are your, op what's out the opportunity, what are the opportunities you, you see? What problems, what issues do you have? What ideas do you have? And we work through this um, in a sequence, and um, then we use that to start a conversation, and then the result of this co coaching canvas is then an agreement where we, by we say, okay, we, this is what we're going to, this is what we agree to do together. And it's a way for us to sort of say, okay, this is the value we can add and this is also what we see from you. Because, um, you know, it's really important for us to understand how we can help 
but it's also really important for people to uh, to take a moment and articulate what they're doing. So one of the things that we are all we're all confronted with when we're trying to help people is they don't have any time. And so using something like this, which is quite structured, actually helps to resolve some of that. So then what we do, and this is where we, we which this is one of the things that I think is quite unique about what we're doing. So then bringing it back to thinking systemically and optimizing locally. What we do then is we, um, between the, the coach and the customer, they agree then on the clear goals and then we, we lodge this in, um, in our confluence area. And then co coaches bring the, co the canvases to our touch point meetings. So from a cadence point of view, on a weekly basis, we have a touch point meeting with all of the coaches and the COE. And that's where all the coaches bring back any canvas that they have completed for that, in that week period. And they talk about that canvas. And what they're talking about there is um, the opportunity to, um, what, they've, what they've found which is an opportunity to minimise waste and also an opportunity to highlight any opportunities that they see for, um, um, for any systemic issues. So that's, that's where we're looking at um, ideas that we can then run experiments on. So we're looking there to try to um, save time but also looking for the best way that we can solve big problems that we've got across the organisation. So, so far we've done, and I know I've only got quarter one um, results in here, 58 um, coaching canvases. And the key systemic issues we're seeing are um, quite, quite sort of low level and ba seemingly basic issues for where we, we thought the organisation was going to be. And they'd be really familiar with to all of you but it's quite illuminating to see that these are still the issues being felt by 80% of our population. So you can see what they are here. And so, um, you know, if we think about improving visibility of work, so we're doing a, quite a few experiments on those. Roles and responsibilities is a really important thing. So that's people feeling really confused about what they're supposed to be doing. And actually, you know, that's, that's a key issue that the, the whole of the organisation is feeling. Um, our CEO said, you know, he expects that um, everyone's going to feel very uncomfortable for the first three to six months of their jobs, which everybody is, has been feeling that, but this is beyond that time period now. But what we've been able to find is that there's really some simple, there's some simple solutions on that because when we started our experiments, we found that um, there's just some really confusing things about role descriptions um, that just didn't get tidied up because from a transformation perspective, um, people working really fast and then roles are actually talked about in three different places and they're actually, um, they're actually, they have had, now they're, now they're sorted out, but they had actually been talked about quite differently in three different places. So no wonder people were confused. So we've, but we've done a whole lot of other work on, on roles and responsibilities. Um, how ANZ objectives can contribute to features, um, epics and stories. We've done a huge amount of work on helping people break down work and, and work out how to prioritise work and prioritise value. So that, that um, alignment between work and value is one of the, you know, we all know, is one of the biggest challenges that everybody has. And we've been running a whole range of, of experiments around that, including how do we make things like our quarterly business reviews, which are enormous meetings, um, much more aligned. Um, down to, you know, how do we kind of help people come to work with a sense of purpose and leave with a sense of accomplishment. So there's a whole lot of um, experiments that are being run each day on those kind of things. Um, and then our maturity assessment. So the other thing that, from if you remember from the quick start, that is really important in terms of what we do, is we conduct maturity assessments with each of the domains, tech areas and squads. And we do those in terms of um, these items, so engineering practices, team health, innovation, customer satisfaction, speed to value, purpose alignment, leadership and agility. And this is where the organisation is sitting on those, um, those attributes for 51 um, areas at the end of, of Q1. So quite low, um, which actually we would expect given the, the population, the level of maturity. And we do then those, we do those quarterly. 
So these have been really interesting from a coaching perspective. So they've caused lots of discussion, which is always good. Um, lots of people have said um, they would prefer to do an assessment once they have really gotten to know the team. And there's pros and cons of that. You could say um, that's great, except that we actually want to get a baseline before we get to know the teams very well, because we want to get the baseline to understand where their maturity is so we can see what impact you're having. Um, we also want the baseline right at the beginning to see to see where everybody is at the beginning. Um, because if we wait until people actually are mature, then how do we know um, where, what they were? So, so we're still working through um, a range of those things. This is one area where, um, so if we look here, one of the, one of the squads, um, we did a before and after in terms of three months, and you can see just, you don't have to see the detail, but just from the, the, pic, the, the picture in the, in the middle, um, you can see that there's, there's quite a change that can be exhibited in, in quite a short amount of time. And so, again, we, we, do, um, we do share these across, um, across squads. Um, some squads are happy to be identified, some squads are happy to be, don't want to be identified, so we de-identify. Um, but it's really interesting to look at the difference in terms of um, what the assessments are spinning up. So we're looking at we're looking at that across the whole organisation. So um, we talked about experimentation. This is our experimentation wall. So we basically use design thinking. Um, we use um, lean startup. So we were inspired by Ash Maria's um, go lean um, process, and then agile um, for delivery. So I love talking about this. If anyone wants to talk to me about it over the next couple of days, happy to do so. This has been really interesting because a lot of the coaches don't have, um, especially an experimentation or a lean startup background, so it's been a great thing for people to learn. Um, and this is, the, this is in detail the way that we've interpreted and we've created um, our goal and approach um, so for, a, for a continuous innovation. So um, we've really personalised it to what we need in terms of the kind of goals that we're creating and how, how it's working for us. And so then how do we score? So um, the other really important thing that we've been challenging ourselves to do as quickly as possible is enable the organisation to understand how it measures itself and also come to terms with, with being custodians of its own measures. So we, we're in a bit of a, um, a, a little bit of a struggle here in that um, we've got a lot of um, people who think that um, putting things into JIRA or a, a similar tool means that they are measuring themselves. And obviously, you know, depending on what kind of data you input, um, that is going to determine what kind of data you output. And so one of the things that we're doing some work on is helping people understand that um, you have to have an understanding of, um, you know, what does, what does your, what, is, what do the inputs mean? So get, get yourselves sorted in terms of what your metrics and measures mean, and then then put put anything into any tool, but actually understand how you're working and make sure that you're really cognizant of um, you know of the, what's meaningful for you as a squad, so that you can understand that the, the measures that you're creating are insightful and enable you to make the best next decision. So our key metrics are lead time, cycle time, throughput, and and squad mood or engagement levels and then value, they translate into value delivered. Um, and then the other thing that we're really focused on is um, in the COE is number of experiments. Um, we also use OKRs in the COE and they're, they're, um, they're being flirted with across the organisation, so some squads are using them. Um, and then we're also focused on measures of value in terms of our features. And how do we keep ourselves on track? So we're also really interested in understanding all the time how we're going. So we ask for feedback all the time in terms of an NPS score on our signatures. Um, we've created a coaching radar. So we use that to um, ask for individual feedback on, our, on ourselves as coaches and also with the coaching accelerator. So we use that as a pop-up to augment our coaching. Um, so we have uh, pop-up coaches, coaching um, opportunities. We've got a squad, um, squad uh, Slack channel and we're also about to start an email channel as well for, for coaching support. And I guess um, that brings us to the end in terms of the coaching. Coaching at ANZ really is about um, 
growing mindsets, um, enhancing capabilities, and um, we're trying to enable overall organisational agility and a great place to work um, in terms of all of those ways. So, um, yeah, we're making rel reasonably good progress, but um, it's, yeah, we've still got a, a long way to go, as anyone who's doing this kind of role knows. Um, it's, you know, progress is me measured in moments, um, and we, we definitely need to take, um, take time to, to celebrate all of the little successes that we, we have, because um, we don't get too many really, really big ones, so um, we do start all of our retros and all of our meetings focusing on great things that happened, um, no matter how, how small that greatness is. So, yeah, that's, that's me. So I'm happy to um, answer any questions. My question is around the reporting item structure. Does that align with the chapter uh, structure or is it a separate matrix or matrix um, organization structure? So the um, chapter is your reporting line, um, but it's not your working line. So your domain, you work in a domain squad, which is different to your chapter squad. So your chapter, your chapter is about growth to mastery, but it's also, it actually also does account for the admin components around sick leave, etc., and also performance goals. But as a chapter lead, you're engaging with people in your, the domain in terms of your performance. Right. My follow-on question on that one then is: if this, the chapter lead is also a kind of like a line manager, uh, responsible for the growth as well as the performance, and quite likely linked to the salaries and and, and promotions, etc., how do you deal with this? kind of like a power structure over there because the chapter lead is going to be a very influencing person. What if this chapter lead is not aligned with the score's objective and tribe's objective? How do you deal with that? So they're not aligned they don't they're not aligned to the squad's objectives. So the domain a domain coach manages a domain a group of domain coaches and they're separate to the chapter. Yeah. So um, So um, in the domain, so the COE domain squads, they're separate to the chapter squads. So I understand that. So yeah. I'm saying then, what if um, the chapter leads, his or her objective uh, is different than what squad wants, and then, but chapter lead has a huge influence on the squad member because he's the line manager, he's pretty much the boss, right? And then if the chapter leads goes to the squad member and say, hey, I want you to do this for me, but that is different than what the squad has signed up for. Who does this yeah. squad member listen to? So I think that the, um, the, the chapters are about their sep that So what's happening in the domain squads is they're working for um, security or risk or someone else, like actually out in the, out in the world, out in the technology world. And the chapters are within the COE, so they are their objectives are aligned to the COE, so their objectives should be should be fairly aligned. So I I I, I, I haven't come across that that challenge yet. We might it might we might, but we haven't had to deal with that. Yeah, we can talk later if, if I'm not answering. Yeah. You showed a coaching canvas. Is that used uh, for a conversation between the coach and the team and the squad? Yes. Is that what it is for? Yeah. Okay. I saw some semblance of the like your typical grow model, which is used for individual coaching. Is that um, the goal reality options? Is is that has that come from the grow model? The idea um, or we it's have used we we. This is an am amalgamation of many, many things. Yeah, so um, it's um, we just kind of mash together um, <laughs> a range of things, right. actually. So, <laughs> how's the coach's performance? Is, is that tied to somehow the 
team i can see this is tied to team performance mm. how does it reflect on the coach's performance well the coach um basically agrees with the domain lead or the tech area lead or the squad um in terms of what they're going to um what they're going to deliver so what so the the conversation is what's important to you and how are we going to do that so just because somebody says this is what i want to do the coach doesn't automatically say okay that's that's what we're, they're not order takers we're in partnership so the 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 first job that this coaching canvas has is to elicit the requirements from somebody or from a team and on that basis it it gives it gives a license to then ask questions and tease out where somebody is coming from and so somebody might and that's where the that's why the the column there in terms of reality is really important so somebody may say i want this 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 in a two week time frame and that's just completely unrealistic so in in terms of the conversation um you know the initial com- especially was if it's a first meeting the initial conversation is mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah we just get that down and then from a realistic point of view we're just going to note some things but the then it's about sort of saying okay that's that's probably um unachievable at this stage but it doesn't mean that um it can't be achieved it means those those things will go on the backlog and let's look at some prioritized items and let's create an an agreement based on these things that we're going to deliver yeah thank you we can take other questions offline yeah lovely okay thanks thanks so much thanks